Well, hello everyone, uh, and welcome to our KDGO webinar series on IgA nephropathy and focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Uh, I'm Brad Roven. I'm a nephrologist at Ohio State University, and today we're going to be talking about the pathophysiology and diagnosis of FSGS. I'm delighted to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Keisha Gibson. Uh, she and I have worked together on several projects, uh, including uh, the KDGO guidelines, uh, where uh, she was uh, one of the uh, work chairs for the pediatric nephrotic syndrome. She's an expert in uh, glomerular diseases. She is associate professor of medicine and, and in fact, the in pediatrics and chief of pediatric nephrology at uh, the University of North Carolina in uh, Chapel Hill. She's also uh, their inaugural vice chair of diversity and inclusion for the Department of Medicine. And I didn't even know, but congratulations, she is also the treasurer of the uh, ASN. Uh, so uh, Dr. Gibson is uh, interested in the clinical uh, treatment and epidemiology of glomerular diseases. She participates in many of the large consortia and is also involved in clinical trials for new therapies uh, for children with uh, glomerular diseases. Um, and she has put together a wonderful lecture uh, today on FSGS, which is one of the, obviously one of the areas of her expertise. I think you'll find this to be a stimulating dis uh, discussion, and then we're going to have live uh, questions and answers at the end. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Gibson uh, to the uh, virtual podium. So thank you, Dr. Rovin, for that generous introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar for the opportunity to present to you today. I do have the following disclosures. As you will note, I am a site PI for a study and serve in an advisory capacity for Trevere, who has co-sponsored today's webinar, but this will not impact the presentation that I'm gonna provide for you today. So to help contextualize the discussion, I always like to start with a case presentation. Um, so I'm gonna give you Sarah, who is a four-year-old child who is presenting with four weeks of edema um, that's been treated as allergies, so a very common presentation. Her edema has progressed to now, she has ascites, lower extremity edema, um, a urine dipstick analysis confirms high-grade proteinuria, her serum, serum albumin is low, and her creatinine clearance is normal. Now, as the treating physician, you have to decide whether you're going to a, start her on prednisolone at two mg per tick per day for a fixed period of time, and then taper to um, um, an alternate dose for four weeks, um, B, treat her at, an, same, at the same fixed dose for six weeks and then alternate alternate day for six weeks. C, pursue genetic testing before you make any treatment decisions. Or D, recommend that she undergo a diagnostic kidney biopsy. Now, many of you will recognize choice A and B as fairly conventional options. Choice C is hindered by the relative paucity of well-defined mutations related to steroid-sensitive nephrotic syndrome, and this is important considering that we recognize that most children in this age group will present with minimal change diseases that cause it in nephrotic syndrome, which is very amenable in most cases, up to 80% um, to steroids. And then as it pertains to kidney biopsy, we understand that steroid responsiveness drives prognosis. So the prognosis for childhood nephrotic syndrome is best predicted by the patient's response to initial treatment and frequency of relapse during that first year of treatment. Um, and so kidney biopsy is not usually needed at initial presentation unless you have a child presenting with atypical clinical features. So um, with an abnormal creatinine clearance, with hypertension or macroscopic hematuria, and or if they're found to be steroid resistant. And so considering this designation of being steroid resistant as a driver for when we do a kidney biopsy, definitions are important. Um, and efforts have been aligned to, um, have been um, definitely afforded to align definitions and promote synergy across our international guideline groups. Um, in particular with uh, steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, um, where we have synergy um, regarding uh, steroid resistance, defining a lack of complete remission at four weeks of therapy with daily prednisolone or prednisone at a standard dose. 
Um, now, IPNA has expanded these definitions to include a, confirm a confirmation period of two weeks to really capture those um, late responders. So once we've designated a child as steroid resistant, in addition to a kidney biopsy and genetic testing where that's available, um, the careful family history is very recommended. Being careful to find out if there are family members with FSGS, if there's a history of consanguinity, because those would elevate the potential of there being a causative podocyte specific mutation. Um, thorough physical exam, paying close attention to look for extrarenal manifestations, again, uh, speaking to genetic um, syndromic um, conditions. And then expanded blood serum and urine tests looking for immunological secondary causes of FSGS or infectious causes of um, nephrotic syndrome like hepatitis, um, EBV, um, HIV, and others. Now, what if Sarah um, is a 26-year-old and very similarly presenting with features of nephrotic syndrome, um, ascites, lower extremity edema, um, urine studies confirming high grade proteinuria and a low serum albumin, and again, a normal serum creatinine. Are you going to, as a treating physician, um, treat her with immunosuppression as denoted here in choice A and B? Um, discuss pursuing genetic testing uh, with her before you make treatment decisions or recommend that she undergo a diagnostic kidney biopsy. Now, very familiar with this audience that I'm speaking to today. I think we all recognize that we're gonna start with the kidney biopsy. And this recommendation to begin with a biopsy in adults is truly supported by understanding of the distribution of different causes of nephrotic syndrome by age. Um, again, while more than 80% of children under the age of 12 will likely have minimal change disease as a cause of their nephrotic syndrome, we understand that older adolescents and adults um, are more likely to have FSGS and membranous nephropathy is definitely more prevalent in older, or shall I say, more seasoned adults. So our 26-year-old patient will most likely have FSGS on biopsy. FSGS is a histological diagnosis or a pattern of injury that can arise from a diverse range of causes and mechanisms. KDIGO specifically defines FSGS as a segmental increase of mesangial matrix with obliteration of the capillary sclerosis, hyalinosis, foam cells, and segmental scarring with adhesion between the glomerular tuff and Bowman's capsule. So on histology, the F stands for focal, meaning some of the glomeruli are involved as opposed to um, diffuse. Segmental, part of the glomerulus is involved as opposed to global. And then G for glomerulus, of course, and S representing scar. FSGS is a common cause of nephrotic syndrome and rapid progression to end-stage kidney disease. Um, if you look at the panel here on the left, you see a nice, happy, healthy um, glomerulus compared to the one on the right um, with the characteristic segmental uh, uh, sclerosis, tough collapse, and hyalinosis. In this um, bottom pictogram on the, on the left, you'll see happy, healthy podocyte um, foot processes that are attached to the glomerular basement membrane compared to um, the electron micro, um, micrograph on the left um, with uh, effacement of the photocyte foot process. So 40% of adults and 20% of children with nephrotic syndrome are going to have FSGS as a cause of their nephrotic syndrome. And this is an expensive disease with an estimated uh, expenditure in North America of $40 billion, and that number is rapidly growing. Roughly 70% of patients with, with FSGS present with signs and symptoms of nephrotic syndrome. Um, you'll find nephrotic range proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, edema that can be dependent or generalized, um, ascites and pleural effusions may be common, hyperlipidemia as a result of increased endogenous um, production as the liver is revved up trying to replace all of those lost proteins, hypertension and microscopic hematuria, all very prevalent um, signs of uh, are prevalent at the presentation of FSGS. It's important to note that a lot of our patients are going to present with acute kidney injury. We recognize with significant hypoalbuminemia, there's decreased oncotic pressure and third spacing of fluid leading to um, decreased intravascular volume. Um, and then in the midst of that, we have increased risk of thrombosis for multiple reasons, a loss of antithrombin-3, protein C and S in the urine, um, 
decreased albumin, all that can lead to this hypercoagulable state, leading to things like renal vein thrombosis that can promote acute kidney injury in our patients. And then exposure to other medications like NSAIDs, which certainly in the setting of volume depletion um, can lead to acute kidney injury. And then certainly we do have a number of patients that are presenting later in their disease process with irreversible um, sclerotic changes um, promoting chronic kidney disease. So the pathophysiology of FSGS um, is really uh, um, centered around um, podocyte injury. And podocyte injury can result from multiple etiologies, um, as you see listed here, um, like genetic mutations uh, leading to disruption of the podocyte cytoskeleton or its attachment to the slit diaphragm. Um, circulating um, permeability factors like SUPAR and others yet to be identified, um, toxins, viral infections, mechanical stretch injuries um, as a downstream consequence of hyperfiltration, among other um, causes. In situations of healthy adaptation, reconstitution of podocyte number um, may lead to recovery of glomerular architecture and function. Um, but in situations of maladaptive response, as we see in FSGS, persistent podocyte depletion um, produces a cascade of steps, um, including tuft adhesion, parietal epithelial cell activation, and segmental sclerosis, all leading to progressive FSGS lesions. Looking at this a little closer, healthy podocytes, as you see um, in this uh, diagram um, to your far left, um, are characterized by the presence of interdigitating foot processes that are attached to the glomerular basement membrane by attachment molecules. And then characteristic structural changes in, in um, injured um, podocytes, as you see immediately to its right, um, include foot process um, effacement and detachment resulting in denuded areas of the glomerular basement membrane that you can see depicted here in um, effacement of the podocyte. And sometimes you'll see um, development of pseudocysts. So in summary, there are four general mechanisms of podocyte injury. One, alteration of the components of the slit diaphragm or interference with this structure. Two, dysregulation of the active cytoskeleton, which is very important for supporting the structure of the podocyte. Three, alteration of the glomerular basement membrane or its interaction with the podocyte. And four, alteration of the negative surface charge of the podocyte. Um, now, you'll have an additional webinar that is focused on treatments of FSGS, and in, uh, as it uh, pertains to dysregulation of actin cytoskeleton, we'll recognize that some of our immunosuppressive therapies, and in, in particular calcineurin inhibitors, are used specifically for its non-immunologic effect of supporting um, the actin cytoskeleton. So recognizing that FSGS lesions represent patterns of injury, Investigators were interested in determining if distinguishable patterns in the distribution of the sclerotic lesions correlated with different mechanisms of injury in FSGS and FSGS outcomes. So in 1994, the Columbia classification for FSGS proposing these five subtypes were introduced, and I'm gonna go through each one in a little more detail. The peri category um, requires that the cellular variant, tip variant, and collapsing variant of FSGS be excluded. Um, and then criteria include both of the following. One, there must be at least one glomerulus with peri um, hyalinosis with or without sclerosis. And two, more than 50% of the glomeruli with segmental lesions must have this peri sclerosis um, pattern. Um, glomerulomegaly, so enlarged glomeruli and adhesions are fairly common um, in this variant. So this perihylar variant of FSGS um, may occur in primary FSGS, but it's also common in patients with secondary forms of FSGS mediated by a maladaptive response to nephron loss or glomerular hypertension. So we can see this in patients with um, obesity, patients with cyanotic heart disease, reflux nephropathy, renal agenesis, or any advanced um, kidney disease uh, that results in a reduced number of functioning nephrons. So I've introduced this concept of primary versus secondary FSGS, and we're going to get to that a little bit later in the presentation. The FSGS tip variant requires that the collapsing variant be excluded, um, and this is defined by the presence of at least one segmental lesion involving the tip domain 
um, or that is the outer 25% of the tuft next to the origin of the proximal tubule, which you can see here um, at around two o'clock. Um, the proximal tubular pole in this instance must be identified um, to um, identi um, in defining this particular glomerulus. So in some cases, the affected uh, segment appears to herniate into the tubular lumen. Segmental lesions may be characterized by either endocapillary hypercellularity involving less than 50% of the tuft or sclerosis involving less than 25% of the tuft. Bone cells are common and hyalinosis is fairly variable. Um, and as I'll get to a little bit later, um, this variant seems to be um, fairly amenable to immunosuppression. That FSGS collapsing variant preempts all other variants. So if you find a singular uh, glomerulus in your biopsy um, that is showing this uh, pattern of injury, the prognosis and the driver of the disease can be presumed to be on the basis of this particular lesion. So a collapsing variant is defined by at least one glomerulus with collapse and overlying podocyte hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Um, the number of glomeruli with defining lesions is highly variable. Um, collapsing lesions can be segmental, they can be global. Um, the hypertrophied um, and hyperplastic podocytes typically crowd um, the urinary space, as you can see in the picture here, and they often contain intracytoplasmic protein droplets and vacuoles. Adhesions and hyalinosis are actually unusual in collapsing um, FSGS, at least in the early stages. Um, mesangial hypercellularity, um, glomerulomegaly, and arterial or hyalinosis are also fairly uncommon in this variant. Um, the FSGS cellular variant is the least common of all the variants um, described, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. Um, but it's defined as having at least one glomerulus that shows um, segmental endocapillary hypercellularity, including, including the lumen, which you can see here at around 11 o'clock, carrier excess, and it can be present with or without foam cells. So perhaps the most frequently found variant, um, the FSGS not otherwise specified category, requires that all other categories be excluded. Um, it is defined by focal and segmental consolidation of the tuft by increased extracellular matrix, obliterating the glomerular capillary lumen. Um, there may be segmental glomerular capillary wall collapse without overlying podocyte hyperplasia. So lesions of sclerosis are typically very discrete and can affect the perihilar or peripheral segments. Um, any number of glomeruli can be affected by segmental sclerosis with or without global sclerosis. Foam cells may be um, entrapped within the sclerotic lesions. Hyalinosis and adhesions are common, but not required. Um, and then finally, we can see mesangial hypercellularity, glomerulomegaly, and arterial, arterial um, hyalinosis. So all of those may be present. So again, one of the purposes for trying to better define these lesions is to see if we can correlate outcomes. And indeed, um, there are a few um, phenotypes that do seem to um, correlate with frequent um, particular outcomes. If we consider collapsing um, FSGS, um, the prognosis um, for this variant is typically the worst out of the bunch. Um, it was a poor response to steroids. Clinically, patients can present with abrupt onset of severe onset, excuse me, of severe nephrotic syndrome, and for reasons that still require. Um, Research it does seem to be predominant in people of recent African ancestry. We'll talk a little bit about APOL1 um, risk alleles, um, which may drive some of this. Um, sort of uh, juxtaposed uh, to collapsing variant, tip lesion actually carries um, the best prognosis um, with the lowest risk of progression in stage kidney disease between 5 to 20 percent. Um, it frequently responds to steroids, um, and um, again, the clinical presentation can be fairly abrupt um, and may present with um, acute kidney injury, but fairly responsive um, to immunosuppressive therapy. So I'm including um, this case, which um, interestingly um, is the case of a 41-year-old man with sickle cell disease who developed nephrotic syndrome. In that singular biopsy, the presence of all four of these uh, different Columbia classification subtypes were found, um, which 
underlines the inability of light microscopy alone um, to classify an FSGS lesion histologically. Um, the electron microscopy here showed diffuse split process effacement. And as I've alluded to before, anytime you find a collapsing lesion, often um, we uh, would assign this lesion as being the predominant driver of high-grade proteinuria and probably prognosis. So on the basis of the diffuse split process effacement um, on um, electron microscopy and this patient presenting with nephrotic syndrome, the clinical team here decided to pursue treating this individual as somebody with primary nephrotic syndrome or primary FSGS rather, which leads into our discussion of primary versus secondary FSGS. So just the steroid responsiveness drives prognosis in children. The prognosis of FSGS correlates with the magnitude and persistence of proteinuria. So observational studies have demonstrated that patients with non-nephrotic range proteinuria may have a 10-year kidney survival rate of over 90% without immunosuppression therapy. It's for these reasons that the KDGO working group felt that the separation of FSGS with nephrotic syndrome should be separated out as its own entity as primary FSGS. So FSGS with nephrotic syndrome and diffuse foot, uh, foot process effacement on electron microscopy. Um, and that since kidney outcomes in patients uh, without nephrotic syndrome remain favorable, patients with genetic, secondary forms of FSGS or FSGS of undetermined cause, again, without nephrotic syndrome, um, avoiding overexposure to um, immunosuppressive therapies. So the practice point was developed that immunosuppression should not be used in adults with FSGS of undetermined cause or in those with secondary FSGS, i.e. those without nephrotic syndrome. And so again, in patients with FSGS but lack nephrotic syndrome, evaluation for secondary causes should be pursued. Um, this is a pa patient population who want to consider genetic screening. We're going to hold off on immunosuppression, um, but be sure to employ supportive therapy like RAS inhibition. Um, and then be sure to monitor their proteinuria and serum albumin over time, because if there is worsening of proteinuria um, and they do develop nephrotic uh, features, then you would follow along the path of treating them like a patient with primary FSGS. So despite 20% spontaneous remission rates, patients with FSGS and nephrotic syndrome have a poor kidney prognosis than those without nephrotic syndrome, with a 10-year survival rate of only 57% compared to the over 90% that we discussed in those without nephrotic syndrome. Um, this is a study of 281 nephrotic patients who were identified um, from the Toronto Glomerulonephritis Registry and then followed for a median of 65 months. Um, they showed a greater renal survival in those that achieved either a partial remission, um, defined as um, a reduction in proteinuria by at least 50%, or complete remission, um, defined as those with a urine protein to creatinine ratio of less than 0.3, compared to those with no remission status um, at all. So based upon um, data um, like these, um, the KDGO working group um, felt it important to highlight, again, those with primary nephrotic, um, with uh, primary FSGS defined as FSGS with nephrotic syndrome as being the patient population that you want to target um, with immunosuppression in the hopes of improving um, their prognosis by achieving some uh, remission status. So due to a paucity of biomarkers, our phenotypic characterization of nephrotic syndrome diseases are largely dependent on histologic classifications. Um, with the common final pathway for many of our glomerular diseases ending with fibrotic changes that can mimic FSGS, it's pretty easy to see how the dependence on biopsy findings may lead to incorrect diagnoses, or at least phenotypic characterizations that do not match the genotype. So one term that's gaining traction is phenocopy, which refers to a phenotypic trait or disease that resembles the trait expressed by a particular genotype, but an individual who is not a carrier of that genotype. Uh, this coin, coin was, uh, term was coined by Richard Goldschmidt in 1935, originally referring to an environmentally induced non-hereditary phenotypic modification that resembles a similar phenotype produced by a gene mutation. So a good example of this is in um, the Drosophila um, 
species Mel um, Melanogaster, where a variety of environmental factors like temperature, shock, or radiation can produce abnormalities in those particular fruit flies that resemble the abnormal phenotype of known genetic mutations or phenocopies, if you will. In this cohort of children in the United States, the following list of genetic mutations were found in children that had a clinical diagnosis of FSGS. So as you can see, there is a variety of different genetic diseases that were found, um, ranging from colophore -A, um, a mutations, hyperoxaluria, dense disease, cystinosis, Fabrase, and you can imagine how the overall outcomes and the treatment approaches of these children may have been um, altered um, having these diagnoses ahead of their histologic FSGS diagnosis. In 2019, Groupman et al. Um, reported their experience um, in this exome sequencing analysis of over 3,300 ethnically diverse um, adults with chronic kidney disease. Overall, about 10% of the patients had a genetic cause, and of those that were identified as having a COLA4A mutation, 62% of those were misdiagnosed or not diagnosed as having Alport syndrome or thin basement membrane disease. So these results illustrate the potential for genetic findings to maybe provide new clinical insights, it may alter medical management, or in some cases just influence the choice of therapy. For instance, I'm not going to inundate um, somebody with immunosuppressive therapy if I know that I'm dealing with a type 4 collagen mutation. Traditionally, we've considered high-yield populations for genetic testing to include children under the age of one or those that had a strong family history of FSGS or steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, but these particular data extend the question of the utility of genetic testing um, for steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome into early adulthood. So more than 50 monogenic causes for steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome and FSGS have been identified. Um, mutation detection rates in pediatric patients with steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome have been reported across multiple cohorts to be anywhere from 10 to 30 percent. Um, in this particular study, genotype-phenotype correlations in a cohort of 290 children um, with steroid-resistant um, nephrotic syndrome or FSGS um, were analyzed. The overall mutation, dete um, mutation detection rate was about 44 percent. Um, so a pretty high uh, mutation rate, with WT1 mutations sort of leading um, the gamut or being the most frequent causative gene. Um, but this was also followed by coenzyme Q6. So 10% of these children were identified as having a coenzyme Q6 mutation. And so this is a disease process that we know that if you find it early on and treat them with coenzyme Q10, it can dramatically alter um, their um, long-term outcome um, with a very favorable response. Um, but if this is not found until much later in the, pro um, in the disease process where we have sclerotic lesions, we now have irreversible disease and have lost our ability to intervene in a meaningful way. So the value of genetic testing can vary by disease, but the ability to confirm a diagnosis is a critical step forward in, me in, in medicine. So as the field of genetic testing has grown, it has become important to report results using developed criteria to not overinterpret uh, the available data and to provide the clearest diagnosis possible. Um, obtaining a genetic diagnosis can lead to the initiation of or change of treatment, as we've already uh, mentioned. Because a genetic diagnosis may lead to unintended consequences like discrimination, genetic testing should in all instances uh, be preceded by patient agreement, so informed consent is very important, as well as any appropriate um, genetic counseling. So the presence of specific variants obviously varies with ethnicity, and so it's critically important to compare the identified variants in a given patient against an ethnically matched data set. The frequency of a given uh, variant in a database may thus attest more to the predominant ethnicity within that database than its potential pathogenicity. So it's very important to remember this. Um, variants for which the pathogenicity is unknown are often termed unclassified, or alternatively, variants of unknown significant or uncertain significance. However, there's a difference between these two concepts. Um, the term unclassified implies that no attempt has yet 
been made to classify the variant with regard to its potential pathogenicity, whereas the term uncertain significance intuitively describes that the available evidence for classification is insufficient or contradictory. Similarly, variants that seem to be pathogenic, but for which definite proof of pathogenicity is not available, are often denoted with the term likely pathogenic. So a lot of terms that we need to be um, very familiar with. Um, our knowledge of the genome is rapidly evolving, and so our ability to classify variants is going to change over time. It is very time dependent. Um, and so with time, a variant may be reclassified to a clinically actionable category. Um, high throughput exome sequencing, um, like next gen sequencing, is revolutionizing. Genetic diagnosis is making it way more available um, to, um, to our patient population. Um, it's greatly facilitating analysis of known disease genes and discovery of previously unrecognized ones. So it holds the promise of enabling personalized medicine. However, the large amount of variants that are identified create serious problems with respect to over or misinterpretation. Um, and other ethical um, implications may include incidental findings of other disease-associated mutations. And then we have to be thoughtful about how to manage non-disclosure of socially relevant incidental findings in reports. So all of these have um, entailed arguments against um, genetic testing, or at least the need to be thoughtful um, if that's the route that we're pursuing. So the Ponanet registry includes children with steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome across 31 countries in Europe. Um, this study in 2015 included almost 1,200 patients, and a mutation was found in about 24% of them. 40% um, of the entire cohort was able to achieve a complete remission with intensified immunos immunosuppression. But I'm bringing this study up in the context of genetic testing uh, specifically because of this. Um, among those with a mutation, 13% of them were able to achieve some transient remission status um, with um, intensified immunosuppression protocols. And so 13% is not insignificant. So identification of mutation does not completely preclude um, an immunosuppression trial, but it certainly should um, tailor how aggressive you are, how long you expose somebody before you uh, expect to see um, some sort of response. We still wanna be mindful of avoiding unnecessary exposure to, uh, to prolonged um, exposures uh, to immunosuppressive therapies. So moving from the realm of suspected causative podocyte-specific mutations to now more risk alleles, um, we're gonna enter this discussion about APOL1 and APOL1-associated kidney disease. So APOL1 encodes the protein, apolipoprotein 1, which lyses trypanosomes, and those are the organisms that cause African sleeping sickness. It's only the disease-associated APOL1 variants, G1 and G2, that can lyse um, Trypanosoma brucei aberdensiense, which is a very resistant um, strain of this organism. If you'll note in this diagram on the left, if you're an individual with zero copies of the allele, you succumb to disease. If you um, have one copy, there is a conferred heterozygous advan uh, advantage over the trypanosome. But two copies of the allele um, confer a homozygous disadvantage where you're still protected from the trypanosome, um, but there's an excess, excess risk of chronic kidney disease progression. So the evolution of this ap 11 variant has been postulated to be a critical survival factor in certain parts of the African continent. And approximately 12 to 15 percent of African Americans in the general population carry two copies of these nephropathy alleles. Um, several genetic mixture studies have demonstrated that the presence of um, these alleles, so the high-risk genotype with two copies, may in fact explain up to 42 percent of the excess risk for end-stage kidney disease in individuals of African ancestry. Now again, it's important to note that it's one in five individuals with this high-risk genotype um, that appear to develop APOL1-associated kidney disease. So we want to be thoughtful about how we're classifying this as a risk allele, as opposed to really understanding if it is in fact on the causal pathway at all. Um, this is a disease of young people, and it's been found that FSGS disease progression begins early between the ages of 15 to 39 in 70% of individuals with two um, APOL1 risk alleles, so again, and those with a high-risk genotype. 
So understanding that APOA1 um, is an identified risk allele, um, there is a growing body of investigators investigating the biologic link. Um, so there's a growing body of data converging on the concepts that mitochondrial dysfunction, metabolic dysregulation, and the loss of gene co-regulation in the high-risk APOA1 state have a substantial and specific role in APOA1-associated diseases. Uh, specifically, in vitro data have supported altered endosomal trafficking with inhibition of autophagy um, identified in APOA1 transgenic mice uh, with glomerular sclerosis, cell membrane injury with resultant potassium efflux leading to induction of stress-activated protein kinases, as you see here in um, this transcriptome um, study, um, looking at 30 FSGS subjects from the Neptune um, study genotype for APOA1 um, um, that um, engage the JAK-STAT and NF-kappa-B um, pathway. Um, mitochondrial dysfunction and upregulation of TGF-beta expression um, have been found um, in different um, in vitro models. And then some Dros Drosophila models, again, defective um, autophagy from altered endolysosomal trafficking. And there's um, a number of additional um, postulated uh, pathogenic path, um, pathways um, that are being investigated. So in a cohort of just under 700 participants enrolled in the AST study with hypertension attributed kidney disease and then followed for 12 years, this analysis to estimate the relative hazard of a composite um, cardiovascular disease outcome did not find that APOL1 risk alleles were associated with an overall risk for cardiovascular disease. But interestingly, um, there was a signal for increased cardiovascular mortality um, noted. So the role for APOL1-associated um, diseases as it pertains to cardiovascular disease is another growing area of interest. So when to think about genetic testing? Um, the 2021 KDGO um, um, working group um, felt that we really needed to look at this and expand um, our thinking in regards to where genetic testing may be useful. So we want to encourage people to think about genetic testing when there's a strong family history or clinical features that may be suggestive of a syndromal process. Um, we want to think about it to help aid in the diagnosis if you have clinical features that are not representative of a particular disease phenotype. Um, in situations where you have a patient um, that you may need to limit immunosuppression exposure, say a diabetic patient and you're trying to avoid excess corticosteroid exposure, or you have a patient who is on treatment but appears to be treatment resistant, we want to think about genetic testing. Um, it can be a useful tool in determining the risk of recurrent disease and, and kidney transplantation. So if I have a child with an identified POTUSM mutation, that helps me with my counseling um, with the family in, in, the, in regards to um, not expecting FSGS to recur. If I identify a nephron mutation, um, I'm not expecting FSGS to recur, but I do understand that those patients may have circulating anti-nephron um, antibodies and could develop um, an anti-GDM um, phenotype post-transplant, and so I'm going to be mindful to monitor for that. Um, allowing for um, risk assessment in living-related kidney donor um, can, um, candidates um, or where there's a high suspicion for APOL1 risk variants. So this is a little bit of a controversial area, but if I have a donor um, that is being worked up and we identify them as having a high-risk APOL1 genotype, um, we want to be thoughtful about not um, imposing uh, new disparities by blanketly um, excluding everybody um, in that category from transplantation, but at least use that information for informed um, consent and informed decision making. If you, if that person, let's say, is a 50-year-old and they have no proteinuria, we, they have no hypertension, they have a normal creatinine clearance, we understand that APOL1-associated kidney disease tend to present earlier in life. That person's risk um, for developing um, disease as a donor may be likened to that of the general population. Um, so being thoughtful of how we're using um, this information is very important. And then in helping families um, plan, um, plan their family, um, that can be another uh, role for genetic testing. Again, we wanna be thoughtful in making sure that if we're pursuing this route, that it is being done um, in a center that comes with, uh, with expertise to interpret the results and to provide the family with the appropriate support um, say from a genetic counselor.
So I'm not going to go through this diagram um, in detail. As you can see, it is quite dense, um, but I just wanted to highlight um, this publication that will be coming out soon in CJSON um, on how I treat FSGS. Um, I was fortunate to be a co-author with my colleague Adrian Liu um, from Singapore um, in um, helping to uh, present a few clinical cases and outlining um, our approach um, to FSGS. And you'll see this um, fairly uh, comprehensive um, diagram um, within that. So going back to our case, uh, because Sarah's FSGS presented with nephrotic syndrome, uh, she was started on high-dose um, prednisone and stayed on this for 16 weeks without um, an adequate response. She was then um, started on a calcineurin inhibitor um, and treated for some time, for six months, but only had a slight reduction in proteinuria and clinically still remains nephrotic. And now the question to you is, what is your next course of action? And so our writing group um, did um, provide this practice point that adults that have steroid-resistant primary FSGS or resistance to or intolerance of calcineurin inhibitors be referred to specialized centers for consideration of a repeat biopsy um, to confirm the diagnosis, alternative treatment, and strong consideration for enrollment in a clinical trial. Um, we are at an exciting time um, across our field where uh, we have a lot of engagement from our industry partners, and there are several ongoing um, clinical trials. I have a few listed out here. This is not exhaustive, um, but just a good representation um, of some of the investigational um, drugs that are out there and being studied. Um, some of these trials enrolling um, children as young as age one. Um, and it's up to us as a community to make sure that we support these studies and enroll in these trials. Um, so that we can find the information that we need to move our field forward and to provide our patients with, um, with, uh, with better treatments. So as we think about um, our need of future directions, um, it's gonna be really important for us to identify biomarkers of steroid sensitive primary um, FSGS. We wanna be able to identify those patients that are gonna respond to um, immunosuppressive therapies or we hope they will. Um, we need to better understand um, the efficacy, how long to treat our patients, um, understand the adverse effects of our already available immunosuppressive drugs. So even the ones that are out there and under um, frequent use, there's still a lot of information that we don't know. Um, we, want to, we want to see the field advance with targeted therapies along the fibrotic and inflammatory pathway, which is tailored to our individuals on the basis of what we're learning through precision medicine. And then also think about um, therapeutics that are outside of medications per se, um, that may um, in fact um, also be of great um, use for our patient population. So with that, I will close. I thank you for your time and attention and I'm looking forward now to moving on to our question and answer session. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Uh... Tisha, and uh, we're ready to go with some uh, questions. Um, and I've got a couple in the queue. I have one myself, just to start off. Um, when we talk about genetic testing, um, you know, there's a lot of options now, a whole genome, whole exome sequencing. Um, we are starting to see and use panels of uh, genes that have been associated with nephrotic syndrome or other um, uh, glomerular diseases. Uh, what, is your, what is your preference and where do you think this, this uh, field is gonna go? What do you use in your own practice? Yeah, so I really think that this is going to be one of those questions that's really based upon where you are and what you have access to. Um, I, and where I am at UNC, we're fortunate to have an internal um, panel that um, is pretty comprehensive um, for most of the mutations that we're particularly interested in and in, in seeking. Um, you know, I think that there um, there obviously are some large commercial um, supporters um, for larger panels um, that are broadly available, and you know, and depending on um, insurance payers. You know, globally, if we think outside of this country, um, access may look very different. Um, you know, we have uh, different um, industries that are coming together. 
um, that are trying to make, um, in particular, um, access to whole exome sequencing um, more available. Um, MVT, I know, provides a nice service um, for a lot of people for a lot of the mutations they may be interested in and has the um, additional benefit of being able to provide genetic counseling support. So again, you know, it's one thing to have access to look for um, these known mutations. Um, it's another thing to have the appropriate people available to help interpret um, the data that you're getting and to understand how do we communicate that um, information in a very responsible way um, to our patients. Um, what do you do when, you know, you get the report back and it's a compound heterozygote? And one of the mutations that is being reported has been um, previously undetermined or previously, you know, not defined as pathogenic, but it's in a protocyte specific um, gene. So we need the support of a, you know, very expertise team um, to help make sure that we are um, good stewards of this information. It's interesting you, you brought up the compound heterozygote. Um, I recently had a patient who has been sort of um, hammered with uh, uh, glucocorticoids. Now, of course, this is an adult uh, patient and uh, not a uh, young adult, but sort of in their uh, late 30s. And um, well, still young compared to me, of course, but uh, not emerging out of childhood. And uh, I did send a panel off because they had not responded uh, to glucocorticoids and they had not responded uh, subsequently to a calcineurin inhibitor. And in fact, their serum creatinine started increasing on the calcineurin inhibitor. So I sent a panel off and I got exactly what you just described, a compound heterozygote with variants of unknown significance um, that are post-site genes but that at least one of them in homozygosity causes trouble. So it sort of begs the question that maybe combinations of these variants may also lead to trouble uh, in different patients over time. And, and you're right, interpreting that data uh, was, is, was quite difficult. Uh, I wound up taking the patient off immunosuppression, and we're going to look at a clinical trial now. Um, all right, so we have some questions from the audience now. There's uh, some really interesting ones here. <clears throat> the first question, which I, I like because I don't know what to do either, <clears throat> and I don't use the Columbia classification, but they said excluding the collapsing lesion, how useful is the Columbia classification for FSGS? in determining the long-term outcomes of therapy in patients with FSGS? Yeah, that, I think that's a very interesting question. And certainly, you know, if I were to sit in a room with um, the team that, uh, you know, elegantly uh, went through determining uh, this classification scheme, I'm sure that part of their, if the impetus to do this was specifically to do just, just that, to be able to prognosticate um, what outcomes would be. And, you know, we've seen, you know, a lot of variability. Um, you know, I think that where the classification may be helpful, um, collapsing, as you've mentioned, yes, we um, have seen more consistency in that outcome. Um, we see a little more consistency in outcomes of patients that have tip lesion, but I certainly have had patients with FSGS tip lesions that do not respond to therapies and have gone on to need transplants, so there is no 100% there. Um, at the end of the day, it really is the sort of the presentation of nephrotic syndrome. You know, is that um, do you see global podocyte effacement? Is, this, is there a high grade proteinuria? Those are going to be the ones that are going to more likely be amenable to immunosuppression therapy. Um, FSGS NOS, um, the perihilar lesion, we certainly see um, more of those uh, presenting with. Um, non-nephrotic range proteinuria. Um, and so you may see that there is a little bit of a correlation there that with the non-nephrotic range proteinuria, those again are gonna be the patients that you approach from a more supportive care, um, 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 a, point, a point of care. So uh, RAS inhibition, um, the, I think the jury is still out on where SGL2 inhibitors um, will fit. Um, you know, I think we DAPA CKD, uh, that sub, uh, subtrial an analysis um, did not you know, definitively give us an answer on how, um, on what role that may play in 
anticipate that maybe there'll be more of a discussion with your follow-up uh, webinar when it comes to treatments. But um, to answer your question, uh, I don't think that the Columbia classification truly helps us to understand what happens in those patients a year, two years out. So I, uh, <clears throat> I agree uh, with you on that one. Uh, this is an interesting question, um, especially, I, I, this is not my question, but since I like to biopsy everyone, but I understand why you don't biopsy children, uh, does the discovery of the antinephrine autoantibody pathogenesis for some cases of otherwise idiopathic minimal change disease alter th your suggestion that kidney biopsy might not be needed for evaluation of uh, nephrotic syndrome uh, of acute onset in children? I think that's an excellent question. I, whenever I am uh, talking to parents about, do we do a kidney biopsy? The critical answer that I have to be able to provide for myself is, is this going to direct my therapy? Is this going to change what we do? And I can't with confidence say that if I know that I have identified um, a child that has um, a nephrine-driven um, nephrotic <laughs> uh, disease process, that that biopsy is really gonna change anything that we do. Um, and just thinking about the increased morbidity because these children are often presenting, you know, in the first, within the first month of life, thinking about the excess morbidity associated with um, trying to get a biopsy on a child that age, um, I, I, you know, really would be difficult for me to um, really justify the why. Um, so um, I, I do, I do, um, one of the benefits I do see from our expanded um, access to genetic testing is that um, there are some situations where I do think that a kidney biopsy may not be needed. Okay. So um, here's a question, and it, it sort of opens up um, a little bit of a, a question. If, if WT1 is positive in a six-year-old female, will, TAC, will a calcineurin inhibitor help? A broader yeah. question, that, you know, I don't know the specifics of this, but you mentioned at least one genetic abnormality that we could, you know, work on with supplements if we get to it early. Sort of, are there other ones that can or should be treated with something like a calcineurin inhibitor that might be amenable? And it's always puzzled me if you have a fixed genetic abnormality of the podocyte, you know, why are steroids working other than steroids do a lot of stuff we probably don't even know about, but let you run with that. Yeah, so I think it's, I mean, I think in the broad context, you know, I think we're all looking for the next mutation that will allow us to find a supplement off the shelf to pull and actually alter the course. I mean, I think that that, uh, um, the identification of the coenzyme uh, Q6 uh, mutation was pretty remarkable. And to my knowledge, um, I'm not aware of another mutation that, you know, has a very specific, uh, you know, treatment from that regard. You know, the WT1 question is very intriguing. Um, WT1, there is a, you know, a variety of phenotypes that we see downstream from that. Um, obviously, we think about Denny Strash disease and diffuse um, mesangial sclerosis, which is a very um, distinct entity in and of itself. Um, and we could see different forms of FSGS. Um, there are other diseases that we see associated with, um, with WT1. And so at the end of the day, with any of these children that have a podocyte specific mutation, I don't think that we have the right biomarker to tell us who's gonna to respond to calcineurin inhibitor, who's gonna appreciate that, um, you know, uh, sort of support of synaptopodin to re, you know, sort of re, uh, restabilize the actin cytoskeleton. We don't have the biomarker to know who that's going to work for. So if I identify um, a podocyte mutation in my children, do I um, still give them a trial of a calcineurin inhibitor? You bet I do. I try. But if I look up and now it's been three, four months and I don't even have a partial response, I'm not going to continue to push hard. We're going to wean off and then we're going to talk about what comes next. Yeah, I, I think that's really, you know, I, that was in, in your lecture as well, and I, I want to emphasize that's really sound advice. Um, a lot of times, you know, we start out as you as you pointed out, and in the adult world as well, 
we have the benefit of having given steroids or at least receiving a patient if you're at a, at a referral center that had been on steroids that didn't respond. And then, um, you know, if we do find a genetic alteration, uh, you know, it's how hard to push. And I think you've provided a really practical answer. Give it a shot as long as you do no harm. And when things start to go south without any benefit, um, it's time to back away. And then perhaps look at, you know, a lot of the clinical trials now uh, are, are taking all comers, even those with genetic diseases, because the, the approaches are sort of to mitigate the consequences of the FSGS, not to stop the FSGS per se. So I do think, and as you also pointed out, there's a bunch of new clinical trials that uh, patients can enroll in. So I think that's really important. This is a, a nice question about the APOL1 situation. Um, in an African-American patient with nephrotic syndrome and non-collapsing FSGS lesion, does testing for the APOL1 risk alleles help to determine the likelihood of a response to steroid therapy? Uh, I think it's a great question, and we really don't have the data um, to answer that question. I'll be very honest with you. Um, again, I think that as we are really trying to understand more about the pathogenesis of APOL1 associated kidney diseases, we still um, want to um, look at your patient clinically and what's presenting in front of you. And so if that patient is presenting with frank nephrotic syndrome, I still think it's worth a try um, to, um, to treat them and see if there is, um, if, see if there's any response. Um, you know, and, you know, we're thinking about um, in, in the prognosis, I mean, cer certainly, um, with this individual, there is evidence of disease. You know, one of the things that I wanted to stress um, in that talk was that we still understand that it's one in five patients with a high-risk genotype that progressed end-stage kidney disease. That means that four in five do not. Um, we don't understand why those four out of five do not, what is protective for them, what is pathologic for the ones that do. Um, and so it's, as we're still dealing with quite a heterogeneous disease when you talk about FSGS, we have to understand that um, APOL1, when you identify this genotype, it still doesn't necessarily mean that you're dealing with a homogenous group of patients. Um, we understand it's a risk allele, um, but there's a lot more that, um, that, we have to, um, that we have to understand about this. Okay, one last question. We're right about at time, but this is a, this is a good question, and, and this is, um, I think put it in a worldwide sense, not just the North American sense. Does the extent of foot process effacement assist in saying the etiology is likely primary FSGS? And I'm going to put a, a, a sort of a second part to it. What about the rest of the world where EM is not necessarily routinely available? Yeah, it's a very important question. And I think that you will find um, that there is a portion of our community that feels very strongly um, that having diffuse podocyte um, foot process effacement um, correlates more with these individuals that we think may have a circulating factor. So, uh, you know, related to um, primary, primary FSGS circulating factor, these are the group of individuals that if we have a shot of responding to immunosuppression, that this may be the group. And you're right, there are a lot of places um, around the globe and even places here in the U.S. where you know, there is not ready access to um, electron microscopy. Um, so um, a, part of the rationale um, behind um, our guidelines was trying to correlate these findings, these microscopy findings, with what people see in front of them, um, in front of their eyes. And so that presence of nephrotic syndrome, low serum albumin, high-grade proteinuria, um, these things tend to correlate um, pretty tightly with the individuals that have pretty widespread podocyte effacement. Yeah, I think I think it, this also really segues nicely into your section on biomarkers. It, it really indicates that we have to find biomarkers in the urine or the serum or both that really can sort out the heterogeneity of this disease, in, especially in regions where we're not going to get EM routinely, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, we're a little bit over time, uh, but I think this has been a fabulous uh, discussion. Uh, I want to thank uh, 
Keisha Gibson for doing a fantastic presentation and fielding all your questions. I want to thank Kay Digo for putting on the guidelines and you know really helping us evolve our thinking. And uh, also, I'd like to thank our, our supporters for this particular session. Uh, this was supported by Trever Therapeutics. So uh, thank you all for attending. Have a nice rest of the day. And um, it's tune into the other sessions. I think they'll be just as fascinating. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.